Time now for some analysis. Rehan Salam is the executive editor of the National Review and a policy fellow at the National Review Institutes. We want to welcome Shauna Thomas to the broadcast. She is the Washington bureau chief at Vice News. David Nakamura covers the White House for the Washington Post and Rachel Bade covers Congress for Politico. Thanks to all of you for coming here. President's going to hold this two week listening session. Rehan, is this about buying time or is this about building policy? Well, I think that there has been a shift in the politics of the gun issue, uh, partly because you see different patterns of gun ownership in the country. And I think that it takes a crystallizing moment like this to lead to a change. And President Trump has demonstrated that he's frankly pretty flexible on the issue. He's expressed a variety of different opinions. And I think it's quite possible that we'll see some movement on some limited gun regulation measures. Some limited movement, <laughs> Rachel. Uh, congressional leadership doesn't seem energized on this like the president does. Is that fair? Yeah, I would say that the likelihood of Congress passing gun control measures anytime soon is probably about as likely as President Trump himself deleting his Twitter account. Uh, it's <laughs> not going to happen, right? Um, there's energy, yes, right now following the Florida shooting. And you do see some Republicans, particularly in Florida, you just interviewed Brian Mast, opening the door to potentially doing some gun control measures. But these folks are the minority right now in Congress. Republicans can call Congress, and they do not see guns as the problem here. These are Second Amendment enthusiasts who, I kid you not, carry pictures around on their phones of you know their latest kill from hunting. They don't think guns are the problem here. I do think we could hear them talk about how this guy fell through the clock slipped through the cracks, you know, did the FBI, what did they miss here, this tip that they had that they didn't follow through on. I think we could hear them talk about safety in schools, but I think they'll say that that is a state issue. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I mean, you ha you're going to have to forget about an assault weapons ban, uh, universal background checks isn't going anywhere, and even this notion of increasing the age to get an assault weapon, it's not going to pass Congress. I mean, Except, the, sorry, go ahead, David. One of the things you, I think is instructive is sort of how this uh, immigration debate played out, the idea that the president was flexible, doing something on immigration, giving a path to citizenship. Uh, but when it came down to it, could he give the cover um, to Republicans uh, who were concerned that he they seems could to be, be trying here? And well, the idea, right, so we see the initial signs that he's, he's willing to talk about gun control in a different way. And he's told staff from, from what we've reported in our newspaper uh, that he wants to go forward on maybe a, a proposal as controversial as raising the age limit to buy guns from 18 to 21. He said, let's go for that. We'll praise the NRA um, to keep th that, that portion of our base happy. But when it comes down to sort of campaigning and giving that kind of cover, we haven't seen the president really do that level of uh, sort of engagement. Just to be clear, you don't think that a fix next could happen? You don't think that's a measure to tighten background checks? To be clear on that, so the president came out this week and said he would back a background checks provision that basically fixes uh, ensuring that agencies are reporting people who cannot have these weapons to the background check system. This is the Cornyn Murphy bill. Yes, the Cornyn bill. However, I spoke with Jim Jordan, a conservative of the Freedom Caucus, the day after the president came out and supported this, and he said there's no way he's going to back it. He said, um, you know, this is a provision that would let bureaucrats take away the civil liberties of Americans, and that's exactly what you're going to hear from a lot of Republicans on the Hill. I think perhaps it could pass the Senate with bipartisan support. Ryan will have to make a difficult decision. Does he want to put this on the floor where it probably would pass? but then he's going to get heat from the right. But I think the difference right now is that over the last week, we saw those students uh, march on Tallahassee. Exactly. Congress has been out of session this past week. They haven't had to sort of deal with the amount of media that you get when you're actually inside the Capitol. That's this week. This mm -hmm. is coming. And so it's going to be a little bit more difficult in the face of those teenagers, especially if people start showing up in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. to say we are not going to do anything. I agree. The fix-nix bill has a hard time passing through the House. The version that is in the Senate right now also has a concealed carry provision in it, right, right. which is not going to go anywhere in the no. Senate. But it is good that at least John Cornyn is talking to the president about this. And there is something that can be done about our background check system because there are so many holes and states need help and money to try to fix some of those Well, holes. Sean, it, people are so interested in this student activism that you mentioned, the march on Tallahassee. There's going to be a march here in Washington. Uh, on the 24th of the next month. Does that sustain the momentum enough? Or is this so politically toxic when a lot of people in Congress are facing upcoming elections that they won't want to go near this? Well, this, this is a different moment because of those teenagers. Is it sustainable? I have to admit, I'm surprised to a certain extent because I'm a cynical Washington, D.C. person <laughs> that we are still having this conversation on Face the Nation today. Um, and that we are still seeing that there are reporters in Florida because the, the news cycle is so fast right now. 
it's kind of in some ways up to those students and they have the power of social media they are a known commodity to media outlets they come here they're going to get interviews they go to the capitol they're going to be seen on camera it, in some ways, it's up to them because I do not necessarily think, especially since it's an election year, this will be run from a political angle. This strikes me as a fascinating phenomenon happening in our politics more broadly. Uh, when you have an issue that's a very familiar issue, that's understood as a kind of culture war issue, suddenly you introduce a class of people who identify as victims, uh, those loved ones of victims, and they change the political dynamic. What happens then, however, is that you realize that there are folks on the other side of this too. There are victims of violence who care very deeply about firearms and gun rights as a matter of self-defense and self-protection. Mm -hmm. Now, during that first phase, you know, you change the conversation because no one wants to argue with someone who's been traumatized, someone who's been victimized. But the truth is that that might wind up distorting our conversation because we can't forget that there are people who feel very strongly, have a deep emotional investment in this issue on the other side too. We see so, that with dreamers and angel moms. And I think that this is something that's going to define American politics for a very long time because narratives and personal stories are compelling. So then is the president going to have to rely on the governors he meets with this week rather than the, the lawmakers here in Washington to get done the thing he says he wants to get done. I do think that governors are a really important part of this. For example, talking about arming teachers. This has become a huge contentious question right now, right? But also, you know, Texas has a school marshals program. The idea is that there are rural districts. There are, you know, places right. where you don't necessarily have the resources and you have people who receive rigorous training just as you have air marshals. Uh, now, when you think about it that way, it depolarizes the issue. It changes the context in a way that could actually be pretty constructive at the state and local Local level, not necessarily as a national culture war issue. But in David, some ways, that does make that does make President Trump's desire to arm teachers or talk about arming teachers who are qualified the perfect issue for him to go forth with, because that's not something that you're going to do on the federal level. That is something that states and localities and all the myriad of gun laws that we have out there are going to control. And so he can say, "Hey, I want to do this in schools." and now leave it to the states and he can run on that. And that's something that the NRA isn't going to go against either necessarily. It's, it, it is in some ways the perfect issue for him. But to Ron's point, actually, if you looked at the president's listening session at, at the White House, which mm -hmm. was pretty extraordinary in that it lasted an hour. And, and was, was broad broadcast live. Broadcast live. Um, you saw the, exactly what Ron's saying, which was that some of the parents were really, and students were pushing for, directly for gun control measures. Uh, but there was a father who stood up who lost a daughter in the shooting at Soman Douglas, who argued very passionately uh, about his perspective as a father who was a uh, grieving, but also then said very emphatically that he supported this idea that Trump had to arm teachers. David, I want to ask you, you talked about immigration mm -hmm. quickly. I want to look at this March 5th deadline. The president's been yeah. tweeting a bunch about dreamers right. and how he's the only one pushing. Are we going to see the same kind of activism that, that Rayhan just mentioned on this as we face that deadline? It's, it's an interesting deadline because, of course, this was the idea that the uh, work permits would begin to run out in mass. Trump said this deadline six months ago, uh, and this was supposed to create some sort of action on the Hill. We saw the White House actively undermine a bipartisan uh, bill that went forward uh, and backed a different bill for Senator Grassley. I do think we're going to see a lot of activism. Uh, the question is, though, the courts have actually put an injunction, so the, the deadline is not as hard as it had been. So we're not going to see those um, work permits run out as, as we thought. Uh, so that could bide a little bit more time. Uh, the, but it doesn't look very uh, likely that any kind of big immigration bill will go forward. You agree with that, Rachel? Yeah, I think uh, they're definitely struggling right now on Capitol Hill. There's been a little bit of talk about potentially extending the DACA deadline for one year for a little bit of uh, border wall money. Um, there is a, a, a bill in the Senate that is gaining traction uh, by John Thune, who basically would propose doing um, three-year extensions for these DACA kids for about $25 billion worth of wall money. I know conservatives in the House are particularly worried that that's going to move because they don't think the wall is enough for them to back, you know, a continuation of this program. Um, so, you know, they're basically going nowhere fast, um, and this deadline is coming. They've definitely got some work to do. What do people need to know about this debate over security clearances and the question as to whether John Kelly will continue to give Jared Kushner one? Well, the president was asked directly about it, put it on John Kelly, and said he'll defer the decision. But, I mean, it seems likely that Kelly would do but what But should people be alarmed? The Government Accountability Office came out just a couple of weeks ago and said that this is now a high-risk program. Uh, obviously, the Government Accountability Office is this watchdog group that looks at various parts of the federal government, and they came out and said giving interim security clearances just for, you know, months and months at a time actually imposes on the U.S. national security. It could hurt the national security. So I think we're going to see the Oversight Committee on the Hill continue to look at this, um, and it's not going to, the pressure's going to be up. It's There's not going to go anywhere. Forgive me, please. Sorry, I mean, the issue really is, 
are some of these people blackmailable? And this is sort of what we saw with Rob Porter, right? Who is alleged, <clears throat> who is alleged to have uh, beat mm -hmm. his wives. Um, and because of that, it made him subject to possible blackmail. The question is, is there something in Kushner's history that makes him subject to blackmail that also is keeping him from getting this security clearance? Right. And if that is the case, which I'm not saying it is, that is the case, should he have access to this information? Mm -hmm. um, I guess the deadline, I think, was last Friday to sort of where John Kelly said he would yeah. cut off that. Um, but we have to just, we have to see whether the White House pushes forward on this. All right, thanks to all of you. We have to leave it there. So much more to talk about. Uh, but thanks for being here today. We'll be back in a moment.